There are several theories regarding the origins of AIDS. According to the most common, HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, is a mutation of SIV, a virus present in certain monkeys in Africa. Infection is attributed to hunting accidents or eating monkey meat, probably in the 1940s. Upheaval caused by migrations large-scale urbanization, and the use of non-sterile syringes all contributed to the spread of the virus. The first sign of HIV infection in a human was reported in 1959 in Kinshasa in Belgian Congo. But it was towards the end of the 1970s in the United States that HIV AIDS really burst onto the scene. Its first victims were men who have sex with men who died of a mysterious illness that could not be identified, let alone treated. In 1981, the renowned Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, in Atlanta, observed an increase in cases of Kaposi's sarcoma, a rare form of cancer. Because it affected a large number of men who have sex with men, it was initially called the gay cancer. But it was quickly realized the disease made no distinction between men, women, and children when choosing its victims. In 1982, it acquired a name, AIDS, for Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. In 1983, future Nobel Prize laureates Luc Montagnier and Françoise Barissinoussi and their team at the Pasteur Institute discovered HIV, the virus that causes AIDS. From the beginning of the 1980s until today, the world went from just a few suspected cases to a full-blown epidemic affecting all the continents. Between 1981 and 2006, 25 million people succumbed to the disease. Research is progressing fast, but not as fast as the numbers of people becoming infected. In 1987, anti-cancer drug AZT became the first medicine capable of delaying the fatal onset of the disease. The mid-1990s saw a small revolution with the introduction of the first tri-therapies, a combination of three antiretroviral treatments that hit back effectively at the virus. Eight in ten people now survive. AIDS has become a chronic disease that's treatable with a range of antiretrovirals but medical research has yet to come up with the most eagerly hoped for therapy, a vaccine. In 2013, over 35 million people were living with HIV. Containing the epidemic depends on the efforts put into prevention, but more importantly, on access to treatment. Worldwide, the number of AIDS-related deaths has dropped by over 30% in 10 years. In 2012, in low-income countries, 9.7 million people received antiretroviral treatment, compared to only 300,000 in 2002. With 25 million people who are HIV-positive, Africa is by far the worst-affected continent. But in 10 years, the number of sick people receiving treatment has increased by 30%. Five countries are noteworthy. Botswana, Namibia, Rwanda, Swaziland, and Zambia. As they have provided treatment, 80% of their citizens suffering from the disease. Other emerging countries such as Brazil, Cambodia, Cuba, the Dominican Republic, Fiji, and Mexico have also achieved what is called universal coverage. But, in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, the number of people living with HIV has increased by 250% between 2001 and 2010. In Russia, the number of HIV-positive cases almost doubled between 2006 and 2012. In the Near and Middle East, where at-risk people are highly stigmatized, the rate of access to treatment is the world's lowest, 18%. 
women are less targeted than men in prevention campaigns, and thus are more vulnerable. Globally, they represent 64% of patients aged between 15 and 24 years, and 71% in Sub-Saharan Africa. Children living with HIV are also at a disadvantage. In 2012, only half as many children received treatment as adults. And without treatment, one in every two children dies before their second birthday. However, there has been progress in eliminating mother-to-child transmission. With proper screening and treatment, the risk of a woman transmitting the HIV virus to her baby drops to 2%. Since 1995, 350,000 children have been spared from infection. In 2015, in France, there were approximately 150,000 people living with HIV. Before getting sick with AIDS, victims are infected with HIV, human immunodeficiency virus. HIV is transmitted via unprotected sex, and direct contact with blood during blood transfusions, and on safe needle practice. HIV can also be transmitted from mother to child during pregnancy, delivery, and breastfeeding. The virus attacks CD4 receptor cells in the immune system. Their role is to launch a counterattack when the body is invaded. Like any other virus, the AIDS virus has to penetrate a cell to replicate. The receptors on its surface enable it to merge with CD4 cells, immune cells. Once inside a CD4 cell, the virus modifies the genetic material. This means that HIV adapts the human genes so that our cells make copies of the virus. In just one day, our cells make billions of copies of the virus. During this preliminary stage, symptoms, fever and fatigue, are often mistaken for the flu. The body hasn't had time to register that it's under attack, and some tests are unable to confirm the infection. Second stage, CD4 cells lead their army of white blood cells into battle against the virus. Once besieged, HIV multiplies more slowly. This is the latent phase of infection that usually lasts for seven or eight years. Symptoms are few or even non-existent, and the immune system continues to function. Third stage, the immune system is overwhelmed. The number of CD4 cells plummets, and the virus proclaims itself the victor. The HIV-infected person falls ill with AIDS and becomes easy prey for opportunistic infections, such as tuberculosis. It's somewhat different for young children. Their insufficiently developed immune systems are unable to combat the virus, and they fall ill very quickly. Left untreated, 50% of them don't live to see their second birthday. The HIV virus is transmitted via blood and during sexual relations. To prevent sexual transmission, there's a widely available shield, the condom. For transmission via the blood, it is important to distribute sterile, single-use needles to IV drug users. For blood transfusions, systematic screening is used to exclude HIV-positive donors. The most widely used diagnostic test is a rapid test that detects the HIV antibodies, proof that the body is defending itself against the virus. Since the 1990s, antiretroviral drugs, or ARVs, have made it possible to live with the virus. ARVs work not against the virus itself, but against the enzymes or the molecules that help it multiply. 
ARVs stop the replication of the virus, but don't kill it. When I started treatment, I had a lot of problems because there were so many pills. I had to take two big pills and they were really hard to swallow. Little by little, I got used to the drugs and I didn't have any side effects. Now, all the pills are combined into one single pill. The medication is easy to take and makes life easier. But we have yet to beat the virus. When it replicates, it can mutate and it can become resistant to antiretrovirals. So we use multi-drug therapy, combining several ARVs. To know whether the virus has mutated, the doctor regularly checks the viral load, the amount of virus in the blood. If it increases, the ARV treatment needs to be adjusted. Checking the viral load is a routine test in developed countries, but is still a luxury in poor countries where there are fewer laboratories. Luckily, within the past few years, simpler tests, such as Samba, have been developed. ARVs are also used as a preventive measure in high-risk populations. Mother-to-child transmission can be nearly eliminated if seropositive women receive antiretroviral treatment during pregnancy and while breastfeeding. The ultimate goal in the control of HIV-AIDS is a vaccine. Multiple teams of scientists are trying different potential vaccines, but viral mutations are making this very difficult. So far, no vaccine has outsmarted this mutating virus. The current problem with HIV infection is that the virus enters into the body's cells, but the antiretrovirals don't actually kill it. The virus stays in the cells for a long time. The current objective is therefore to attack the infected cells, either to achieve remission from HIV infection or to eradicate the infected cells. For remission, you have to greatly reduce the number of infected cells so that the patient's body is able to control the infection. To achieve eradication, all the affected cells in the patient's body need to be eliminated. Today, the advent of eradication strategy remains a long way off, much further than the successful strategy of remission. In order to successfully reduce the reservoir of infected cells, we're tackling the problem of differentiating between infected and healthy cells. We need to find specific biological markers on the infected cells to be able to identify them. Another option would be to reactivate the virus in order to identify it in the cells and then destroy it. So we need effective immune responses which could be developed thanks to work on a vaccine. During the past few years, there's been impressive progress in this field. Even though we don't have an available vaccine yet, we now know the characteristics of the immune responses that we need to develop. We need to optimize an adapted strategy to provoke these now well-understood immune responses. There are promising preliminary results in animal models. The vast majority of HIV-infected children are infected either during birth or around the time of the birth, mother-to-child transmission. The problem is that these very young children need to be treated as quickly as possible. Without treatment, nearly half of these children won't see their second birthday. The WHO recommends treating these children as early as possible to diagnose the children as soon as possible after birth. The problem is that the products that are available are poorly adapted for children. Some of the syrups are toxic, some aren't stable at high temperatures, some are difficult for the mother to administer because she has to give a certain number of milliliters of one syrup, less of another, and more of yet another. It's obviously quite difficult for the mother. So the recommendations are excellent, but they're almost impossible to implement properly. DNDI's mission is to resolve exactly this problem, 
by combining the necessary different medications into a single product to avoid syrups, to have a solid formulation and something that masks the taste because one of the drugs tastes terrible. It's a daily battle for the mother to give it to her child.